you'll recall that up until the release of DSM-5, OCD used to be classified as an anxiety disorder. It was thought that the OCD rituals were functioning in exactly the same way as anxious safety behaviours, same same. But then some unusual trends started to emerge. One of the medications that is sometimes used to treat anxiety disorders is Xanax, a benzodiazepine. Well, these anxiolytics work really well with anxiety disorders, but they do absolutely nothing to alleviate OCD symptoms. This suggests that the heart of OCD is not actually anxiety, and this means that the move to put OCD and related disorders in their own category away from anxiety disorders was the right thing to do. So if drugs like Xanax don't work in treating OCD, then what does work? In the first lecture this week, we spoke about how SSRIs are really effective in treating OCD, but only if they're taken for a long period of time, long enough for the drug to make structural changes in the brain. Another really effective treatment is a talking therapy called Exposure and Ritual Prevention, or ERP. Despite their differences, this treatment works in a similar way to exposure therapy that we have discussed in anxiety disorders. The safety behaviours, this time the compulsions, are prevented and the client is very gradually and systematically exposed to the feared situation. For OCDs, psychological therapies like ERP have a very high level of effectiveness, one that's actually superior to SSRIs. Another more radical treatment is something called deep brain stimulation and if you're a fan of sci-fi, strap yourself in because this one is out there. So, well, Back in the Dark Ages, not quite, it was 1947 and two surgeons by the name of Ernest A. Spiegel and Henry Wykus performed what they called a frontal leucotomy on a patient with OCD. You may know this as a lobotomy. And after many decades of deliberately giving people brain damage, it was finally decided that this practice was unethical and alternatives probably needed to be found. Fast forward a few decades. At the time, researchers developing treatment for Parkinson's disease were experimenting with a technique called deep brain stimulation. They inserted a very, very fine microelectrode deep into the brain, into the striatum. Now, something you may not know, sometimes people with Parkinson's disease show repetitive and uncontrollable movements that are very similar to tics and the rituals associated with OCD. Sure enough, the DBS helped patients regain control of their bodies and get some functionality back. Not surprisingly, researchers and clinicians have had some really great success with DBS for the approximately one third of people with OCD who are resistant to conventional treatments. More than half of the people who undergo DBS treatment for OCD experience between a 25% reduction and full remission of their symptoms. Despite this, DBS remains strictly experimental and only available to a very select group of OCD patients who have failed to respond to multiple rounds of conventional treatments. Like I said before, DBS for OCD is often directed at the striatum and here it can help stop the repetitive rituals. Remember that one of the functions of the striatum is to signal when a habit routine is finished. Despite its promise, it's still not entirely clear how DBS actually works. It does seem to change the rate that the neurons are firing in certain parts of the brain. And this seems to calm the tics associated with some types of OCD, as well as Tourette's syndrome and Parkinson's disease. But DBS is not a miracle cure for OCD. It comes with substantial risks, including brain hemorrhage and infection. Also, this is still an experimental procedure, so it's important for the effectiveness of treatment to be routinely monitored. We know from early on in the course that a double-blind study helps researchers test whether a treatment is effective or whether any improvement is due to placebo effects. As part of the DBS procedure, each patient goes through an active stage where the device is switched on and an inactive stage where the device is switched off but the electrode still remains in place in the person's brain. The person's OCD symptoms are then monitored throughout this period to see if the device is actually doing what it should be doing. However, in a meta-analysis of 80 patients who had DBS for severe treatment resistant OCD, four patients experienced suicidal thoughts, 
two patients attempted suicide, one of those patients attempted suicide twice, and a third patient tragically completed suicide. Whilst the risks of DBS are usually mild, instances like this remind researchers, clinicians and medical authorities why it remains a strictly experimental procedure that is only used as a last resort. In lecture one this week, we spoke about hoarding disorder and how it is similar to OCD, but it's also a very distinctive form of obsessive behaviour. Before we wrap up, let's quickly discuss some of the treatments for hoarding disorder. Firstly, it's important to acknowledge that many people with hoarding disorder go unnoticed and untreated unless authorities are called due to the unsanitary living conditions on their properties. People with hoarding disorder don't usually seek out treatment because there is a lot of shame surrounding hoarding and the person can feel a distinct lack of empathy from the family and clinicians who are supposed to be trying to help them but want them to depart with their dearly beloved items. If the person does get into treatment programs like CBT, then compliance is usually low. The goals of CBT for hoarding are to help teach the person how to decide which items are valuable and which items are not. Ideally, this training is done in the person's house so that they have an appropriate context to their learning. For people with the excessive acquisition subtype, the client and the therapist can go for non-shopping trips through places where the person usually over shops. I need to stress that like all forms of CBT and indeed all treatments for mental illness, these talking therapies are not just casual chat that anyone off the street can look up on the internet and do themselves. Talking therapies like CBT are conducted in a very strict and particular way and they actually change the structure of the brain. Because of this they must only be attempted by someone who is qualified to perform them like a psychologist or a psychiatrist. It is not safe and it is definitely not ethical for someone who is not appropriately qualified to attempt to treat someone with mental health issues. Anyway, back to hoarding. In one particular randomised control trial, CBT significantly reduced symptoms in 71% of people who complied with the treatment in the experimental condition. On the other hand, zero people on the waiting list control group showed any signs of improvement. Medication has some mixed success for hoarding. Some studies report good improvements and others report little to no improvement. Like OCD, both SSRIs and SNRIs have shown promise. Interestingly, some early research has had some success with psychostimulants that are used to treat ADHD. This might seem a little surprising, but it makes sense. People with hoarding disorder struggle with decision making and ADHD drugs increase the availability of dopamine in the frontal lobe, allowing the frontal lobe to work and make those decisions. We'll talk more next week about the different classes of drugs and how they work in our final week together. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time when we talk about drug use and abuse.